today's episode of Still to be Determined, we're going to be talking about what this little piggy built his house out of. That's right. We're talking about, <laughs> well, unfortunately for Matt, he's the little piggy. Mm-hmm. Hi, everybody. I'm Sean Farrell. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And I'm just generally curious about technology. And with me is my brother, Matt. It is that Matt of Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, how are you doing today? Doing pretty well. I realize I'm a little scruffy today. I forgot to shave. Yeah, I'm a little. <laughs> I just noticed that. I'm a little scruffy today, Whoops. too, it's because I have a beard. <laughs> yes. Before we get into Matt's most recent episode, which was a discussion about his home that he is building and his experience with watching what used to just be a pile of dirt turn into a house. Yeah. Very exciting stuff. But before we get into that, I want to share some comments from our most recent episode. This is episode 153 on fusion energy production. And there were some interesting comments like this one from Thelgel who wrote regarding it being described as a breakthrough. Breakthrough isn't the right term in my mind, he writes. I think a better term is milestone. I like that. I like the idea Mm -hmm. of of not measuring it based on it shatters the paradigm, but it's another marker along the road to progress. So I like that. It's kind of the vein of uh, the word advance. It's kind of in that same realm. There was also a correction for us. We couldn't think of the device that Professor X in the X-Men uses to (laughs) cast his his thoughts and be able to read minds at a distance. And Cartman... (laughs) writes in, I think the word you're looking for is Cerebro. Love your work, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Yes. I also wanted to mention this comment from Metalhead, who wrote, thank you for addressing the fact that seemingly every media output only heard the Department of Energy's chance of America, America, America in their fusion ignition press event. It is, first of all, it's understandable that the Department of Energy, excuse me, the Department of Energy would yes. be touting American endeavors. That's what the Department of Energy is going to do. It is also understandable that there's going to be some discussion about what progress in American tech looks like when you're talking about something that's been funded by the Department of Energy. But one of the key things that Matt and I do talk about on this is that this is not a sign of progress for the United States only and that these developments Mm. are not taking place in the United States only. There are so many places around the world that are in various ways, measurable ways ahead of American progress. And those need to be acknowledged. They need to be looked at and we need to figure out how can we either utilize or work with those developments in order to move forward ourselves and pull other people along with us. So this is when Matt and I talk about this stuff, we really do view it as a global effort because most of the things we're talking about are about measurable global impact and how humans can more sustainably live on this weird blue ball that we all ride around in space. on. (laughs) So thank you for that metalhead. Thank you for, for pointing that out that yes, the, the media outlets kind of ran with a America first idea, a little bit understandable in this case but also something to keep in mind as we talk about all these things. So now we're going to talk about Matt's most recent episode. This is from February 7th. Wow. I didn't know a passive house could do this and no, his (laughs) passive house didn't do anything miraculous. Like just get up and walk away. But he did. It's very passive. It it is passive. (laughs) It just sits there. It just sits there. (laughs) But the experience of watching this thing built and I, first of all, I have to say that's one hell of a ladder you must have to be able to get all those aerial shots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, it wasn't even it's a very tall ladder in the shot. wind. It wasn't even moving. Yes. It was just totally static. And I imagine that at the very bottom of that ladder was your wife holding it with one foot up on a rung, keeping it steady. So <laughs> hat tip to her. Yes. But seriously, yeah. though, your ability to capture video like that is kind of creepy. <laughs> any of your new neighbors standing out there and like is that a drone is a guy with a drone building when, a house right next door to us whenever i've used when i've used my drone here on my current house <laughs> my neighbor a couple of times has come out and gone i thought i thought we were under attack because mm. <laughs> it's that <laughs> it's zooming around yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a little creepy. Hopefully, if you know your neighborhood is under attack, it will be something as non-threatening as a little buzz like that. Because yeah. if that's what sets your neighbor off, it's a good thing you're moving. Yeah. I joke. Yes, exactly. Matt's got very nice neighbors. Yeah. Some of the comments on this were from people who have had similar experiences, but going back in some cases like this one decades, this is from Schnitzen who writes, I'm glad to see that this is picking up in the U S my parents had one of these. And I'm going to say, I'm going to try and say this. I'm going to slaughter it probably, Good luck, Sean. but it is a German term furted guile house built in Germany in 1996. It took one day to set the walls and another day to put the roof on, including the clay shingles. They also had a solar water heater installed with three panels on the roof that work flawlessly to this day and provide hot water for most of the year, even at 51 degrees latitude. When I moved to the North Car when I moved to North Carolina in 2006, I was a bit shocked to see how much energy it takes to pump the heat through the house. It's really indicative of there's something in the the mindset in the U S building environment versus other parts of the world where this kind of house built in 1996 versus what was being done here in 1996 and continues to be done even to this day, even to this day, what do you think are the, is like, if you had to say like, I'm guessing it's, this is the cause of this non-development into new tech, into new ways of building homes. What do you think the prime cause of it is? Well, it's the cost of energy. The, the company building my home is Unity Homes, which is a subsidiary of Bensonwood Homes, which is a very well-respected company that's been around for decades. Ted Benson actually was at the door, blower door test. He actually was on our way to a meeting in Connecticut and he stopped by for the blower door test. He was there when it was happening and he and I were talking we talked about this exact issue. I asked him, I'm like, what is the, what do you think is the reason that you see homes like this all the time in Europe and nothing like this in the United States? And he said, um, that's been a big discussion in the industry. And one of the things is cost of energy. It's like the United States cost for gasoline, oil, natural gas is way lower than any place else in the world. And so our energy costs are so low. It's like, why would you spend extra money to make a home energy efficient or increase the building standards, which would cost, increase the cost of building a home just to buy a bit when heating at home is dirt cheap or electricity is dirt cheap. Why would you do that? So it's like, it's he not, thinks that's it's not viewed why. as being worth the investment. Like you're right. Spending hundreds of thousands of dollars more to build the home, but then you're only saving right. thousands over it's a like multi-year period. It's like the return on investment. Yeah. And then also in the United States, I think there's something a little different here than in Europe suburbs. Like you have builders coming in and building developments where they'll pop down a hundred homes in a sub development. And they're doing it as fast and as cheap as they can to turn it around and make a quick buck and move on to the next subdivision. Um, they're going to cut corners. They're going to go to the base level standard that they have to go to and not beyond that because that would eat into the profit margin. So that's another thing that's kind of eating into it. But now that the fact that energy costs are skyrocketing, even here in the United States and climate change is a concern for a lot of people, it's like, there's enough momentum behind it where it's like the United States is starting to wake up and go, oh, there's a better way to do this. And so we're starting to kind of catch on to what other areas of the world have been doing for decades, yeah. which is just really sad. It's frustrating to know that sometimes it yes. takes being underwater to realize you have to worry about flooding. And yep. that seems to be what you're describing is yep. very poor foresight and thinking very short term. And I also wonder about the speed with which perhaps I wonder about home ownership here in the United States, how long home ownership actually lasts as opposed to other parts of the world. Well, do we move more? Do we sell our homes more? Do we upscale more often? Is it viewed as it doesn't matter that this house is energy inefficient because I'm only going to be here for five years. I really don't know the answer to that, but it's an interesting question. I think. Well, the other thing is like back to that cookie cutter subdivision home building, they're building it to base level standards to, to turn on a dime and make a quick buck and move on. They're not building houses to last a hundred years or more. They're building homes just to make something that st stands up, meets base code, move on. And it's, if it's fallen apart in 50 years, they don't care. So it's like almost like a disposable home. Yeah. And a lot of these cookie cutter homes, they basically start to degrade and fall apart pretty quickly and start to have problems where Benson would Ted Benson 
his whole thing was he wanted to build heritage homes. He wanted to build homes that are going to be here hundred plus years, even longer, something that's going to outlast you without question. So it's, I'm glad that people like Ted Benson exist in the United States to try to help push this forward. Mm -hmm. But that's like when I was trying to build this home, it was like, I wanted to build a home that's going to be a, a, a long-term home that's going to go way beyond me and be super energy efficient and well-built. So that was my motivation. Yeah. But I wish more people shared that. There's something brought up by one of the commenters whose name is Trevor Flowers. And Trevor writes, basically wondering about comparison of the resources around the house, water systems, roads, and all of that in, in comparison to a urban co-living community. And I'm curious, you built your yeah. house in an already existing neighborhood, but yes. how would yep. your choices have been impacted if you were building much more remotely? That was actually on the table. Like we were looking at properties. The reason we settled in the property we did, it's a, a suburb. It's a small town that we're in. It was already established. We wanted to live in a community that was already kind of there. We're not far from the downtown area, so we could ride a bike, walk, we wanted that kind of stuff. Other properties we were looking at are like, we're like, you know, here's your nearest neighbors a mile and a half away kind of a thing. It's like you, you buy, you're buying 10 acres in the middle of nowhere. Th if we had gone that path, it would have been like, we'd be having to drill and create a well for water. We'd have to be doing things like for us, if we had built out in the middle of nowhere, it would have been having to drill for water, have a well for water, having to do a septic system because we wouldn't be on a sewer system. So where we we built, we're going to be on city water, city sewer, but there are options that you can do no matter where you are. Um, one thing that's been of keen interest for me would be rainwater harvesting. The property we bought and the house we've built, it's going to make it a little difficult to do, not impossible to do rainwater harvesting. But if we were more remote, I probably would have done that from the get go because you can integrate that into the house using, reusing gray water and stuff like that. So if we were on well water and septic. I probably would have investigated that more where for our current house, it's an afterthought. It's like, I'll figure that out down the road if we want to do that um, instead of doing it up front. What goes into that? Is it water traps or something that takes the, the rainwater off the roof and gathers it in a cistern? Well, if you want to integrate it into the house, you have to do it for the, the plumbing from the get go, like before you lay the foundation, you're going to have to like segment things of like. The water that comes out of the dishwasher and the kitchen sink goes into a different area than the sewage. Like sewage goes into the septic system and this water gets funneled over here into a gray water system that can be used for whatever you want to do, filtering it and using it for whatever you want, whatever you want to do. Right. But it's th that's part of the reason why we didn't do it because it was going to add extra cost. And it was like, we just, it was so expensive already. It was like, let's put that, th let's table that idea for now. Where if we were more remote, it would have been a little more urgent to think about that stuff up front, because like if we wanted to make sure that we are, we're not going to run out of water, <laughs> we're going to have everything we need. It's like that may have been part of the conversation at that point. There was also this question from Lucas Kerper who wrote, he was curious if you considered a basement as a geothermal benefit. Your house is sitting on a foundation that is not a basement, and you mm -hmm. have talked mm -hmm. to me in our many conversations about this new home, about designing it intentionally for aging in place, one floor, mm -hmm. no stairs. Once you're into the house, you can move throughout the house without having to go up and down stairs so that as you inevitably get older and your knees get creakier, God bless your knees. Yep. But as yes. they get creakier, you don't have to adjust to stairs as much. Was a basement a part of that thinking, or was there something else that kept you from going with the basement house? And the number one reason, Sean, was cost. It was honestly, it was cost. Second reason was it was way more concrete. Concrete's not the most environmentally friendly material to make. Mm. And so it's like, it, one, we didn't need a basement. Two, it was going to add something ridiculous, like, I don't know, $60,000 to the cost of the home. And it was like, okay, we can put that money elsewhere. Three, we're aging in place. We're not going to want to do stairs. So we're not going to be going down the basement much anyway. So why would we want it? Why would we pay the extra money to get yes. it? We just don't need it. The, it wouldn't have added any kind of benefit to the geothermal system at all. Yeah. None. Uh, the only benefit it would have given is more room for the mechanicals. <laughs> We've run in a, into a little bit of an issue in our the design because we have a mechanical room that is going to be jam 
packed. Like it is, it's like stuffing sausage. It's like mm. <laughs> we got the HVAC system, a D superheater for the hot water that feeds into a heat pump water heater and an ERV system all crammed in this little room. It's all going to fit. But it's like originally the electric panel was supposed to be in right. there and it was like, it's already too You're full. We can't put the electric like, panel in there. Like sideways, like <laughs> shuffle in. <laughs> <laughs> so regardless, it's like, and then on top of that geothermal systems, you basically have their compressor inside your house. So there's noise in the house. So we're having to insulate the mechanical room and use a sealed door so that it's to isolate the sound as much as we can, where if it was a basement. You don't have to worry about that as much because it's it's the basement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of isolated from the rest of the house. So th there's pros and cons, but it just wasn't worth the money or the extra concrete, or any of that stuff. So we just said no. In a similar vein, there's this question from Omar who writes, I figured you would go with some of that hemp create insulation that you mentioned in previous videos, but I'm surprised you didn't. What are your thoughts on heated floors, driveway, radiant heating from the floors always made the most sense for me logically, but I've always wondered how they actually perform when applied. So first question, you've talked about a lot of different tech in your videos. Yep. And then this house mm -hmm. is utilizing some of that and not others. You talked a little bit Correct. already in this conversation about some of the decision making, but again, what was it about certain things like hemp insulation that you didn't move toward as opposed to what you didn't move toward? Well, hempcrete is not structural. It's great for insulation value and it has to have its own structure. And this is a slab on grade. So it's like we couldn't do hempcrete for our floors. It would not be appropriate for that. So it was not even an option. When we were discussing maybe doing a basement, we were thinking of doing something called ICF, which is it's basically like styrofoam. <laughs> Ah, you're basically building like a little star foam, um, form, and then you pour concrete in the middle of it and then you leave it. And then that way the concrete is actually insulated by the star foam on both sides and it's cheap, it's fast, and it's r extremely well insulated. We were looking at th considering that until we ejected the basement. And of course, once again, you no longer need that anymore. Right. So th that was part of the reason why we didn't do some of that stuff. It just wouldn't have worked for what we were doing. Um, it wasn't a, a damning statement of like, I talked about hempcrete, but it's actually crap and I don't want right. it. It was not, it was just like, it wasn't the right tool for the right job. So we just didn't do it. So what was the second part of that radiant, question? There was like, uh, heating, uh, floors, radiant driveways, heating? anything like that. Yeah, that, that came, that was a hot debate between me and my wife <laughs> nice for pun. a while. We were trying to yeah. figure, yeah, yeah, we were trying to figure it out. We hired a mechanical engineer to help us design the HVAC system that did not work for any company or anything like that. He worked for us. So he was helping us design the system that satisfied our needs mm -hmm. and radiant heating for the floor came up a bunch. It's the best. If you're heating a house, it's like the best way to do it. Hands, hands down. It adds a little to the cost, but for comfort, like nice toasty floors, mm -hmm. the house has no cold spots. You don't have vents in the walls and all that stuff. It's just, it's just, it just works. It's nice. It doesn't have that period where it's like the, the system's running and then it gets hot and then the system's not running and it gets cold. It's like, it's just this even just oh, all the time. Mm -hmm. My wife and I are not, don't like the summer heat and humidity that we get here in new England <laughs> We're air conditioning people. And what that, if you got the in-floor heating, you still have to get some kind of vents or mini splits or something for air conditioning. So it's not putting so in, the question it's came not up putting like, in one system versus another. It's putting in two systems versus one. Correct. It was like, okay, so if we do the radiant floor heating, we still have to have vents. We still have some mini splits. We still have to do something. It's like, why are we going to do two separate systems when we could have just one system that does everything all year round instead of having right. it's radiant in the winter. And then it's that thing on the wall in the, in the, in the summer. It was like, let's just do one, um, to stick to one system. Um, that's the main reason why we did it. Yeah, I have a little bit of familiarity with radiant heating from floors only because my son's bedroom sits above the furnace and hot <laughs> yes. water room, room in the building his that we live in. Great. And his room <laughs> is consistently nice and toasty, 80 degrees, the heat coming off of the floor. We actually put a throw rug in his room mainly to keep it from getting too hot. We had to provide some insulation to keep the heat out of the room. <laughs> and there are times when yeah. he comes out of his room in the middle of January and the rest of us are freezing because this house is not well insulated. And he walks out of his room and he's wearing a t-shirt and shorts and he looks like he's just coming off of the beach in Florida. So <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. 
Well, thank you everybody for your comments. As you can tell, if you're a regular listener or maybe you just dropped in for this one, the comments really do drive the conversation here. We really rely on you to give us feedback and let us know what you're interested in. So let us know what you thought about this conversation. And if you have any other questions about what Matt is doing with his choices regarding his, his building of his home, Matt, I'm guessing this is not the last we're going to see home building oh, no. videos from you because there's multiple stages there's in the future as far as what you're going to be doing. Any insight yes. right now as far as like what a couple of those are going to be? And are any of them, and I only ask this because I know my parents, your parents, I know our parents. Are you going to have anything yes. about landscaping? Are you going to be talking about choices as far as like <laughs> yeah. environmental impact when you've built a home? What can you put in around yeah. that home to make it environmentally friendly on the outside of the home? Are you going to do anything like that? Yes. There, we actually are hiring a landscaper. We're about to talk to them about what we want to do, get their input as to what we can do. I don't know if it'll be a dedicated video for that, but I will be talking about it in some video at some point. But yeah, there's going to be a video coming up on once the electrical plumbing and the HVAC duct work is all done. The duct work is actually already done. They're about to do the plumbing and electrical now. It's like I'm planning on doing kind of a video around what those systems are looking like, why they were done the way they were talking about the home networking I'm doing to add smart features to some of the house. Then there's going to be one when it's all done, kind of walking through the whole system when it's all set up and finished. I'm going to be doing one about the solar panel system and battery once that gets installed. So it's, there's lots of videos to come. Good stuff. And if, and if you're interested in a particular aspect of this house and what I'm doing, let me know because I'll, I'll, I'll consider doing something dedicated just for that. If, if there's enough interest, interest in it. Yeah. You can drop that in the comments here. We'll be happy to yeah. share those with Matt as they come in. And you could also on his main channel, you can jump into the comments on his most recent video about the home building and drop those there. He'll see them as yep. well. Yep. Don't forget, if you'd like to support the show, please consider going back to Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever it was you found this podcast, subscribe, leave a review, share it with your friends. If you'd like to more directly support us, please click the button join on YouTube or go to stilltbd.fm. Click the become a supporter button there. Both those options let you throw some coins at our heads. We appreciate the welts. They get better and they help make this podcast and the main podcast happen. Thank you for taking the time to weigh in with your comments. Thank you again for, for listening or for watching on YouTube. We'll talk to you next time.